Like, I don't know why you're trying to persuade me. Hmm. Because your own Bible says it's a gift. that it's a gift, it's the work of the Spirit start to finish, it's a, it's the, a removing of a heart of stone and replacing with a heart of flesh. That is not something you can do for me. Yeah. For questioning what the Calvinists say. Hello and welcome to Sociology 101. Today we're going to talk about how Calvinism can lead to atheism. Now, I don't want to be unfair to my Calvinistic friends by suggesting that uh, you know, uh, Calvinism uniquely causes atheism. Obviously, that's not the case. There are people who come from a traditional background that end up uh, leaving the faith or becoming atheistic, if you will. Um, and just like when you, you got accusations about, you know, Calvinism leading to, uh, you know, becoming anti-evangelistic. Um, I, you know, personally uh, know a lot of people who are not very evangelistic from our tradition. Uh, sociologically. And so I, I don't want to be unfair by trying to suggest that um, that Calvinism automatically will lead people to atheism. That's not my goal here. Uh, my goal instead is to say that if Calvinism is false, which we believe that it is, and people are stating Calvinistic interpretations as reasons for their abandonment of Christianity to, altogether, then I think that's that's worth looking at and helping people to understand why that's in, that that that's a significant thing for apologists, especially because I've even played clips of, of many of you've heard of John Piper. Uh, there was another one of the Guillaume uh, Bignon, uh, the French uh, theologian that recently wrote a book about uh, Calvinism, um, where they both make statements like, "Well, you know, I, I would rather you believe in libertarian free will and still become a Christian than to uh, to leave behind Christianity because you can't swallow the the difficulty of the pill of of divine determinism, i.e." Uh, compatibilistic Calvinism, um, and so uh, there, there's a desire there for people to, if if this what it's if, it's, if that's what it takes for you to believe, um, uh, to give up the the con- the concepts of Calvinism, then they would rather you do that than to than to abandon the faith altogether. Um, and we went over this a little bit back with the uh, the interview with Megan Phelps on the Joe Rogan uh, program. In fact, I tried to pull up the original YouTube video with Joe Rogan, and I couldn't find it. I could only find my uh, rendition of it and and my playing of it. So um, just to remind you of that, let me play a short clip here from that video that you can go back and watch if you want to. But listen to Megan Phelps go through Romans 9 from the Calvinistic perspective and ultimately uh, stating as the reason she left uh, Christianity altogether. Why does God allow that? So this is why I'm not a Christian anymore. Oh, um, you got confused, and you're like, what the? Well, so there's this a passage in Romans 9. Well, it's not, it's not the only reason I should say, but, but I, have really, I have real trouble with this, and I think it's, it, it's still hard for me to say, I think this is evil, but I think this is evil. There's this passage in, in Romans 9 that talks about, uh, it gives this analogy of God as potter and humans as clay in his hands. And it uses the example of Jacob and Esau, who... In the Bible, Jacob and Esau were twins. And it says, while they were yet in the womb, before either of them had done good or evil, God loved Jacob and hated Esau. And it, so it paints this picture of God, you know, it says, what if God, willing to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath made for destruction? So it says, God created some people as vessels of mercy, people that he loves, and others as vessels of wrath made for destruction. So made for the express purpose of destroying them, of torturing them in hell for eternity. So, and then, so he, it's Paul who's writing, he, he paints this picture, God making you do all of the things that you do, and then blessing some and cursing others. And he says, well, you'll, you're going to ask me then, why does God yet find fault for who has resisted his will? Right? So yeah. if God's making you do it, why is he punishing you for it? Right. If God's making you do a horrible thing and you resist his will. You can't resist his will. Right. And so he makes you do it and then he punishes you for it. And the answer is, you don't get to ask that question. Oh. It says, nay, but O oh man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? You just don't get to ask that question. And to me, so this is, I've asked, like, for, I spent a long time talking to Christians uh, and, you know, people of, well, mostly Christians, because it's obviously this New Testament, so, and, but also talking to Jewish people about the Old Testament and found so many of the, like, interpretations, so many of the, our beliefs are not, they're not fully supported by, by the Bible and that there are so many different ways of interpreting so many of our 
the more destructive of our beliefs. But that one, I have not found any explanation for that passage that's anything, that makes any kind of sense, that's consistent with the text and, and not evil. And I just, I didn't, I thought I couldn't ask that question for so long when I was at the church, right? I thought, I just have to accept this. This is the truth and nothing that I feel or think matters against it. Um, but now I, I can't not right. think. Of course. I can't not ask the questions. Well, and then, I, of course, I go on to, uh, to give answers as from the, uh, the Calvinistic perspective on uh, how we would interpret Romans 9, where you don't come to the conclusions that, uh, that uh, Megan came to. And today we're going to talk about another uh, atheist now, Derek Webb, uh, who is the lead singer for Cademan's Call. Um, and, and any of you who are my age or older probably remember Cademan's Call. Um, Derek was very influential in, in my own uh, walk. Uh, I remember his song, Thankful, um, which we may look at the lyrics for, but very Calvinistic lyrics. Uh, and that, that was rare back in the 90s, especially to have somebody so Calvinistic, uh, you know, coming out in, in support of Calvinism through his lyrics. He was cool, you know, and had, and had lyrics. Matter of fact, um, the, uh, the, the Gospel Coalition um, uh, has uh, the top 50 most influential um, people. Uh, let me pull that up real quick, just one second. Yeah, this is from the Gospel Coalition, the top 125 uh, influences on the gospel-centered movement. And, of course, the gospel-centered movement, according to uh, Jared, uh, the author here, uh, is, is as he says here, I try to think keenly about the folks whose voices have uh, given shape to this still-developing movement, sometimes called Young, Restless, and Reformed, neo-reformed, gospel-centered. In other words, when he says gospel-centered, he means Calvinism. And so he's listing the top uh, 125 most influential people in the rise or resurging of uh, the gospel-centered, i.e. reformed, i.e. young restless reform movement. Uh, even those who may not even consider themselves to be a part of that movement any longer, he, he explains. But those are the names we talked about before. John Piper, Matt Chandler, Tim Keller, Archie Sproul, Mark Driscoll, all these names. Well, you go down to number 40, I think it's 48, uh, 40, uh, 49, there it is. Derek Webb. And so that's who we're talking about today. So he's obviously been uh, influential enough to make it in the top 50 from the Gospel Coalition of one of the most influential voices. And it was because of, of in the 90s, songs like Thankful um, and, and uh, like Prove Me Wrong from uh, Cademan's Call. Um, you, many of you have probably heard Thankful um, when he says there's none uh, he, there's none righteous, no, not not one who understands. There's none who seeks God, no, not one, no, not one. I am thankful that I am capable of doing any good on my own because we're all stillborn and dead in our transgressions. We're shackled up to the sin we hold so dear. So what part can I play in the work of redemption? I can't refuse. I can't add a thing. Uh, and he goes on. Um, and so he, he was singing these songs, and I was very influenced by uh, Derek Webb's work. Uh, back in the day, um, because this is when I was first coming into Calvinism. He was one of the first uh, singers. He's about my age, about the same age. We're both in our early 40s. And uh, and so he was coming out with all these cool songs at the same time I was learning Calvinism for the first time. And so he was one of kind of my heroes. I remember going to see him in concert and everything else. And I remember hearing when I hear these songs, just being so, uh, you know, thankful, if you will, <laughs> that there were songs that were, you know, promoting what I believed uh, Calvinistically. And I even remember my first interaction online, because the internet came out in the mid-90s, my first interaction online, theological discussions, was on Derek Webb's chat board, uh, where we were debating with Arminians. Us, me and my Calvinistic buddies were all you know, slaying the Arminians on Derek Webb's board. He would stop in occasionally. He never you know, interacted a lot on the web boards, but occasionally he would jump in and chime in with us as a fellow Calvinist. Uh, to uh, to to debunk the uh, Arminians that were on the the, the page uh, trying to to uh, rattle our cages and back and forth, and uh, and so I remember Derek Webb uh, quite well and was very influenced by Derek Webb's work, and so Derek Webb has uh, since you know just recently in 2017 become an atheist, and that's when a, a particular article came up by one of our listeners who's been on the broadcast before. He's a supporter, he's a patron of the podcast. He's been somebody that posts online quite a bit. He always has really good things to say. Um, and his name is Steve Fraley. 
And he wrote this article, What Happened to Derek Webb, back on Saturday, October 13th. And so I called up Steve, or we, we messaged back and forth, and I said, hey, can we do a broadcast? And uh, he graciously said yes. And so here's Steve. Welcome, Steve, to the program. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Tell me what what led to the to to the uh, article that you wrote, which, by the way, very well written article. I will put the the link in the show notes for people who want to go read it for themselves. But what led to uh, you writing this article? Uh, well, well, first of all, I've been a Cademan's Call fan for well, I guess you know twenty years or so, um, basically from, since they first emerged on the um, Christian music scene. Um, so I was getting into Christian music at, at that time. There were a lot of a lot of exciting bands that were forming at that time, and uh, they really caught my my ear, I guess you could say. Sure. And um, also, you know, not only musically, but they they were uh, they certainly came across as very serious um, serious minded Christians in their lyrics and. Um, at the time, I wasn't Calvinism wasn't on my radar, right? So I I didn't I I it, it was many years later when I was re-listening to Thankful that I realized, wow, this is Calvinism here. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yep. um, it's kind of well, I still like the song, but um, but it, it's kind of kind of put a little bit of a bittersweet uh, taste to it as as I would listen to it. Um, going forward. Well, and this is part yeah. of the issue is that, you know, I, you know, I, I have a lot of Calvinistic friends and, I, and I've known some from, you know, the Facebook page and other places because of the, this podcast who message me and talk about how they left the faith or they were close to leaving the faith because they really believe Calvinism was Christianity. I mean, they equated the two as one and the same. Um, and, and it's, it's interesting that you, you had sent me a link to a, a podcast called Unravel. Um, which we'll play a clip from here in a little bit, but notice the the, the title of this, um, the title of this particular podcast with Derek Webb on it is called "How Christianity Made Me a Better Atheist" with Derek Webb, um, and and I would probably want to retitle that and say how how Calvinism made me a better atheist with Derek Webb because ultimately what you will hear him doing throughout this entire broadcast is describe Calvinism as if it is Christianity. Um, and of course, that's that's the question up for debate, um, and 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 it becomes the question as would Derek Webb have abandoned uh, Christianity as described by traditionalists in the same way that he abandoned his Calvinism, um, because he seems to be convinced, like Megan Phelps in the the clip I just played, that that God seems evil, that there's there's a sense in which it's just really uh, obviously hard to swallow that God is is doing these things. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I want to go through some of this in your article because you bring these things out. But it, it, it's one thing to read it, and it's another thing to hear it for yourself and to see him actually saying it. So why don't we start right here by um, playing a clip of Derek Webb talking to a, a, a friend of his named Matthew Cook. Uh, this is produced uh, back in September the 10th of 2018, not long ago. And I'm picking up at the 57-minute mark. And this is where Derek Webb really explains, uh, I think, you know, ultimately why he left Calvinism and his argument against the whole concept and idea of, uh, uh, you know, how Calvinism, in a sense, is is uh, become circular arguments and and uh, how he reasons that his faith is uh, his faith is gone ultimately because he's he's not chosen, which is some of the lyrics within his song and everything else. And so, let's listen to this clip first, uh, Steve, and then let's discuss it tricky yes. because because Christianity is not a tolerant open it's not. religion yeah it's not yeah and, and if and, it will be that's going to be a future thing that's right. going to be very divorced from what we are the experience that we have of it as it's laid out in the Bible and yeah. and but the thing is like I remember at the time kind of being okay with that I mean hard as it was yeah. to have to be honest about it, it's like listen this isn't my fault yeah and I don't know why I get it and some people don't you know I go back to Ephesians 2 8 9 I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not it had nothing to do with me. Yep, yep. But I do, for whatever reason, see this. Yeah. And I wish I could, I wish that I had the luxury of telling you that you could behave in any way that you wish and yeah. you can believe anything that you wish and that all roads are going to go to the same place. Yeah. But that's just but not what the Bible says. Yeah. I tell you my story and I can tell you what I believe it says. 
and then you're gonna have to reckon with that yourself. Yeah. And I can't convince you, but I can pray yep. and things like that. We can all depend on the Spirit. What, which interestingly is where I leave where I, where I leave it now. Hmm. And with my Christian friends who try to convince me of this, I say, listen, like I don't know why you're trying to persuade me. Hmm. Because your own Bible says it's a gift. that it's a gift, it's the work of the Spirit start to finish, it's a, it's the, a removing of a heart of stone or replacing with a heart of flesh. That is not something you can do for me. Yeah. So if it's true, we're both depending on the Spirit to show yeah. up. I'm literally in the grave next to Lazarus yeah. waiting, for to the hear, waiting, waiting to hear my name. Yeah. And I'm going to lay in there dead till he shows up. Yeah. Somebody asked me uh, near the beginning of this year living Christianly, well, what would it take for you to believe? What would it take for mm. you to believe in God? Well, that's easy. God would have to give me faith yeah, yeah. because um, I can't yeah. reach out and yeah. grab it. What it would take is a miracle. It would take a miracle. Yeah, it would. Like, and, and what, 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 what does it take for a dead man to come, out of his, to come six feet out of the ground? Yeah. It takes someone to dig him out, yep. to open the box and revive him. Breathe into his nostrils. And, and the Bible makes it very clear that there is nothing less spiritually than that going on. Yeah in salvation. Absolute new life. New life from death to life. Yeah. And that's what would be required. Yeah. And and I I, I And I'm open to that. it. I'm, I mean I'm oh, literally yeah. I'm literally in the grave waiting to hear my name. Yeah, any time. If, that, if that's the picture. Because if there is gonna be a work of the spirit going on, I want in. And I won't be able to resist it. And yeah. I can't call out for it. Yeah. I cannot coax him over. Yeah. Either my name is written in the book of life or it's not. Yeah. And, and I mean so if we're gonna really get into the language, the hard language of the Bible, provocative as it may be, mm -hmm. like I'm had to, I got to a point, I don't like binary ideas or statements, but yeah. there's a few that feel emotionally like they are, yeah. although maybe they're not. But there's a point where I said, you know what, maybe, maybe God made me and fashioned me for destruction. Yeah, 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 vessel for that. Because he, he, he says he does that. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, through, for the good pleasure of his own will. That's right, of his and, and he receives no counsel but his own about yep. that. And so there's nothing I'm going to be able to do to change his mind about it. So maybe it's all real and I'm just not chosen. And yeah. that's a thing I'm going to have to just, that's just a thing I'm going to have to reckon with. Yeah. And that's not a thing I can really do anything about. Right. And it would so, seem unnatural and almost, it would seem shady to try to do something about it in a way, to try to strong arm a faith no. into oneself. So I'm going to try to make the best of this. Yeah. And I'll, and I'm listening. Yeah. I'm. Having said I mean, in, in as far as Lazarus was listening the moment before he heard his name out of Jesus' mouth. Yeah. Which a dead man cannot. Can't. So he wasn't listening. No. <laughs> he wasn't paying attention. Yep. He wasn't flagging someone down. He wasn't wishing or hoping for it. He wasn't, he wasn't seeking. leaning forward. He wasn't seeking it. No. Nope. He was just suddenly called out. Yeah. Came alive and came out. And that was the only response he could have had. Because he had no choice. And because he had no choice. I mean, that's a hard, that's a hard and biblical word. Yeah, and um, and that's the Christianity I resonate with. Me which, too. Yeah. And so what's so funny is that all my friends call me um, like like a reformed atheist because because when I do pick up the language of Christianity and start to speak it again, which is it's a language I'm fluent in. Oh yeah, just like you it's can still have tongue. the the accent of a country you no longer in which you no longer live. Yeah, and I, you can still detect the accent on my my speaking, but. Um, ah. I go immediately into that reform view, only because it's just the one that seemed to make the most logical sense to me. It was very it's, consistent. It's the one that seemed like it made the most sense of the whole thing to me. Yeah. And so that's still the one I go to. And some of my friends, so, so what's hysterical is that I will find myself in theological debates with friends arguing a, a biblical position, yep. arguing from a Bible that I have no belief in. <laughs> but I'm just like, but I'll, I'll argue all the tenets of reform theology with them and sometimes win. Yep. And then at the end of it, just have to say... That was weird. And by the way, that was weird because I for sure don't believe any, any of what of either of us have just been talking oh about. Oh, my God. Uh, wow. Now, I, you know, I, when you hear it put out that clearly, um, and you heard me on the broadcast before talk about how people can come to these conclusions, how I even struggled with some of these things as a, as a young Calvinist and dealing with my own addictions, which is another thing he talks about in another broadcast about sexuality and... Uh, you know, problems like that. But this is this is where the rubber meets the road. This is when it comes down to really how people can walk away from Christianity as a whole because of the unique claims of Calvinism. And, and I don't know uh, how many people listen to this broadcast on a regular basis, but you know full well what we say about Lazarus. Uh, that if, you've, if you go to Sociology 101, type in the term Lazarus, and you will find several articles where I go through the fact that Lazarus is never tied to soteriology, um, but that's what Calvinists often do is they'll, they'll refer to Lazarus as an example of uh, soteriological deadness and that we are made alive in the same way that he was called out of a grave and therefore we're just as passive in that process. 
Um, and and I, I just encourage people to dig deeper and to recognize that Jesus even says, I delayed coming so that you would see this miracle so that you may believe, which doesn't seem uh, even needed if, uh, if uh, effectual regeneration is at work. And so um, I, I appreciate, uh, Steve, you bringing this to the attention of our listeners and myself, uh, because I think it really practically lays out how it can be, how Calvinism, not always, but can be taken to seed and, and in a wrong direction and lead people even to leave the faith altogether. Um, talk about that a little bit more. What, what, what are you seeing even through this? How are people reacting to your article? And, and maybe, maybe highlight some other points that, that uh, you want to from your article as well. Yeah, I would say that um, uh, kind of what inspired me, because I, I didn't really get into that earlier, but what inspired me to write the article was um, there was a discussion on our um, Facebook group um, where they were, uh, someone was saying kind of like, well, do Calvinists ever doubt their their election? They always seem to be confident that they're yeah. elect. Well, I've always heard and that. Yeah, you never find was, a, you never can find a Calvinist. Uh, you never can find a Calvinist that don't doesn't think they're elect. And well, here's one. Yeah, yeah here's one. Here's one that actually affirms yeah, that, like, you know, the Bible teaches Calvinism, but doesn't think he's one of the elect. That that was like you know. Well, I, I thought back to the Cadence Call lyrics from "Prove Me Wrong," which kind of showed they were dealing with. Um, now, "Prove Me Wrong" wasn't written by Derek. It was. Um, and it was other members of the band that kind of took the lead on that one, but it kind of reflected the mindset of the band. Right. And it's basically about dealing with that doubt. Am I really chosen or am I like Esau? Um, and, uh, maybe all these doubts that I'm dealing with they're there because I'm, you know, I'm not one of the chosen ones, you know, prove me basically calling on God please prove me wrong and take these doubts away. I just pulled um, up, I just pulled up the song, uh, prove me wrong by Cabin's call. Just so simply people can see that for themselves. Let me just read this. It says, sometimes I fear maybe I'm not chosen. You've hardened my heart like Pharaoh. That would explain my, why my life is so hard for me. And I'm, I am sad. Esau hated crying against what's faded saying, Father, please, is there any left for me? Cast out my doubts, please prove me wrong, because these demons can be so headstrong. Make my walls fall, please prove me wrong. And it goes on with that kind of, of lyric. Uh, and it really reminds me of back of an of a earlier episode where I talked about uh, when we summarize Calvinism and, uh, and, and the tulip of ultimately the T means no one can want God unless God wants them. And uh, God does not want everyone uh, under the U, under conditional election. In other words, he hasn't elected everyone. Uh, L is God sent Christ to pay only for those he really wants. Uh, that's what limited atonement is about. Uh, I, if God wants you, then he'll make you want him, which is what uh, Derek was uh, iterating there. If, if God wants me, you know, he'll draw me to himself. He'll, it's a, it'll take a miracle. And it's an irresistible miracle, as he even pointed out. And then uh, God makes those he wants uh, he, he makes them to keep wanting him forever. Uh, and that's ultimately what uh, Derek is, is presenting as what Calvinism ultimately is. And, and therefore, you've got this, this kind of a systematic where he, instead of taking responsibility for what he believes, he falls back onto, well, if God wants me to believe, he'll make it happen uh, and it'll be irresistible. So I'll just, you know, sit here and wait for him to do that instead of taking responsibility for my actions. Yeah. So when I originally, uh, oh, I'm hearing my echo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that happens. Uh, keep going. Sometimes it'll it'll uh, it'll go back out. You're you're fine on this. Okay. Side. Yeah. So originally, when I wrote that response, it was um, uh, I I didn't know about Derek and that he had um, come out as atheist um, a year before. Um, so someone else on the board then responded and said, and with a link to um, an article where he was, um, you know, they were discussing that and, and with links to his lyrics and that sort of thing. Um, so it, it then just 
kind of um, that that inspired me then, you know, as I was thinking about that and thinking, wow, this this guy really he was committed to um, the doctrines of grace and really eloquently put them in song. I mean, if there was an anthem, uh, you know, from Christian radio, I, I've never heard anything that really puts um, the Calvinistic doctrines of grace into a song in the way that thankful does. And to see that now he's kind of on the other side of that, where before he's writing it from the perspective of I'm a Christian and I'm thankful for being chosen. Now he's on the outside of it as an atheist and, and saying, I'm clearly, I'm clearly not chosen because this faith that was a gift that was given to me. I no longer have this gift of faith um, and it's just gone up in smoke and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, I'm just waiting here like Lazarus for, for God to, to give me that gift of faith. If he's, if he really wants me um, to, to believe in him. So, isn't it his uh, most recent album that's called uh, uh, Goodbye for Now? So I say goodbye for now, goodbye for now, goodbye for now. So I say goodbye for now, goodbye for now, obviously talking to God, I'm assuming. Uh, he says, so I'm back in the corner of this bar just studying a glass and these faces. I've been looking for the one I lost and for eternity in the wrong places. So either you aren't real or I'm just not chosen. Maybe I'll never know. Either way, my heart is broken, as uh, as I say goodbye for now, goodbye for now, um, and that just breaks my heart. Uh, and it, it, it breaks my heart if anyone leaves the faith. You know, not just obviously Calvinist, but it breaks my heart when when I can see something that's preventable. You know, if if you can you can you can help redefine uh, and help people to understand that these passages don't have to be taken. Uh, like the Calvinists say, so that you ultimately uh, don't have responsibility for your faith. Because when you don't take responsibility for your faith, matter of fact, um, instead of me talking about that, you talk about that because you you really uh, do a good job in your article uh, explaining about taking responsibility for uh, before for our faith. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is. From the Calvinistic perspective, it's definitely seen as glorifying to God, obviously, to give him credit for, you know, everything in the in the process of salvation. And when we go back to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, um, and the way he interpreted that, you know, those verses and in the lyrics to Thankful, there's that subtle twist, you know, through faith that's not my own. And that's the, you know, um, I, you know, when we look at the actual structure in the original languages, I'm no expert in in Greek or, you know, in in that sort of thing. You know, I'm just a layman here. Yeah. But, um, you know, I've I've certainly heard you know William Lane Craig and different people discuss the the original languages and how they use like gender. Sure. Uh, well, and w what's interesting about that is even John Calvin, in his commentary, uh, admits that uh, it, that the the this is not referring back to faith individually. Uh, this is not of your own. Yeah. Uh, even Calvin is a good enough scholar to recognize and and uh, you know honest enough to say it's referring back to salvation as a whole. And, the, and that's when I was I always go back to the conflation of the Calvinists with regard to yes God is the author of salvation yes God is responsible for who's saved and who's not uh, that doesn't conflate the fact that you're still responsible for your confession and your faith uh, he's responsible if he saves those who have faith and trust in him he doesn't have to do that he chooses to do that graciously uh, but you can't f conflate the choice of the father. Uh, to receive the son with the choice of the son to actually come home in his humility. Those are two separate choices. Uh, just because the, the son chooses to come home, however, doesn't mean that the father's obligated uh, by, by, by merit or something like that to, to receive him when he gets there. His only obligation to receive him is, is, is 
his own gracious love and provision he, he because he wants to, in other words. And so I, I always have to continue to point that out because that's just a misinterpretation of that passage to say that faith is some kind of an effectual thing that God causes within his elect. That's never established biblically. Um, and we have you know a, a ton of articles and uh, broadcasts on that particular subject. And I think we see the misapplication uh, of that and the detriment that it can cause, not always will, obviously, but that it can cause with someone like it did with Derek. And that's what we're trying to address here. Um, on on the uh, the Unravel podcast that you uh, brought up earlier, um, he, he gets into this responsibility thing, taking responsibility uh, for his actions. And it's almost like when he left Calvinism, I won't say Christianity, but when he left uh, Calvinistic Christianity, let's put it that way, it's like he shifts and begins to take responsibility for his his life, because before it was almost like he was giving it all over to God. Um, and it's really interesting because this this relates to things that are happening to me at my own home, because my wife is a, a family therapist, and she talks about this quite often. And she gets so frustrated in in the Christian uh, world because so many people are putting off their healing, uh, and and they're ultimately putting it onto God. You know, it's like they're, they're put so much, uh, you know, onto God of saying, okay, God's responsible for my healing. God's responsible for the, God's responsible for this pain. God's responsible for this so much so that they never take ownership for their actions, their choices. And, and it's almost in a sense, they, they, what, you know, therapists will call a victim mentality of this is, this is the way God made me. This is just where I am. This is what, this is the lot I've been dealt uh, this is what's been fated for me. This is what God's planned for me, and 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 so the way they they handle their problems and their addictions and their issues is to say, well, God has to get me out of it, you know, and I'm just going to give it all to God, quote unquote. And and what becomes so frustrating to my wife is that that becomes such a cop out for doing the work that's required to overcome addictions, to overcome uh, personal problems and preferences, and that's exactly I think related to what you see Derek doing back in his life. And so I wanted to play this clip that you sent me, uh, Steve, and let's just listen to it um, here from the Unravel uh, podcast, again, with Derek Webb talking to uh, Brady Troops, Brady Toops, I think, uh, from the Unravel podcast. Trust him and I don't like him. And maybe mm-hmm. he is in control. Maybe he is both the great theodicy of can God be both all good and all powerful? Um, and that's because that's the great question, because then that calls the, 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 the theodicy then calls into question, you know, everything from the Holocaust to natural disasters to how could God be both good and right. powerful? Can either he's powerless to stop evil or he uh, or he's not good enough and he tolerates it or allows it or governs it. And, and boy, this gets into tricky territory. So yeah. for me and for, so what Patton Oswald says, maybe he is perfectly governing all things. Maybe he is both good and powerful and he's just an asshole. And I and. And I'm, I, and maybe so, honestly. So, and there's a line on my new record that, um, just really in, great, it, by the way. Thank you. And there's fingers, a, it's called Fingers Crossed. Fingers Crossed is the new record. And the last song, the closing song of the record is called Goodbye for Now. And there's a line in it that says, So either you're not real or I'm not chosen. Uh, and maybe I'll never know, but either way, my heart is broken as I say goodbye for now. Hmm. And that's kind of where I sit with it now is like, I'm open to it winding up being true. I'm just not persuaded that it is. There's like a real grief process uh, here in the midst of that, where something that was so dear to you for so long that you sort of now go, I I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the thing that you spend 30 years building and tinkering with and constructing and perfecting and, you know, the grid, the literally the grid through which you look at the world for it to make sense to you, it, it gets torn down by your own hand and, and by a lot of hands around you, it gets torn down, it collapses. And then you kind of are looking at the matrix and you can't make sense of it for a minute. And you have to begin out of desperation, reconstructing some new grid through which to look at the world, which I think I am in the, I am in a reconstruction phase. I'm just not using any of the pieces that were torn from the grid through which I was looking before. I'm just not finding any of those very helpful right now. So again, what, so the adjustment for me though, is from looking external for my hope, what I'm holding responsible for the world being better or changing my hope for the future. Um, even my, the aim, the target where I'm putting my gratefulness or my anger, all of that used to be external and now Mm -hmm. it's internal. So I'm taking responsibility and it's actually been 
kind of a joyous thing. I've never kind of been happier or felt freer. In this moment? Absolutely. Well, I guess when there's something out there, you give away your power to this thing That's to right. sort of bring the thing you're hoping for, some some moment of happiness or a promise or a, a dependence on this thing out there. But you're saying, I grew tired of waiting for this out there thing that now I don't know whether it exists or whether it's for me. And I've, right. I've now taken the power back to where... Yes, or taking the responsibility The back. responsibility. Yeah. And what's crazy about that... At one point during our conversation already, I said something about how I feel as though I have no objective moral grid Mm -hmm. anymore, which I don't. And you would think, oh, oh God, that means, I mean, what are you doing? Are you just like murdering people or like speeding all the time? Are you just like doing, having crazy behavior? And you know what? I'm not. And let me tell you why. Because again, the shift from the external behaving to come in line with something to, to which I feel as though I owe my life to suddenly that coming internal and me saying, okay, what is in line? Who is the man who I want to be? What kind of life do I want to live? How can I make good choices in line with healthy behaviors that dignify the people around me and myself, my physical body? What's crazy is behaviors that I struggled from my adolescence through my adulthood to keep and never, ever had a moment's worth of victory over have been literally easy and no problem. So the practice of Christian morality, I'm a better practicing moral Christian now than I was previously. (laughs) I mean, like sexual things, which is the easiest thing to go to for any human being. Things like that, like we're like a real struggle. And I mean, like, let's get get real and talk about like pornography and things that are like the really, the things that you really feel that are easy targets for shame that are typically for most people are unhealthy ways of meeting healthy needs, things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's such a struggle and it's so hard, or it can be in seasons, things like that. I'm just like, now I don't have any external reason to do or not do anything. And yet I find myself saying, you know what? That just does, that's not consistent with a a healthy personal behavior. That's not the man I want to be. That's not the life I want. That's not creating good patterns of behavior in my life that is line of sight to what I want for myself and what I, Mm. what kind of partner I want to be for somebody. Mm. And the example I want to set for my children and the narrative that I want to tell them about who I am and who I am as a sexual person and everything else. And, and so what I'm not saying is that Christianity failed me. I just, I, maybe I, I managed to practice it poorly because I think you can do both. I, I think that you can, you can practice, practice it, it in such a way that's and not... And maybe even misunderstand it. A hundred percent. That's exactly right. So I, I'm not, I don't want that to sound as though I'm saying Christianity failed me or the practice of Christianity. Again, the religion, which is the practice of the belief, the spirituality is the belief. The religion is the practice of the belief. Maybe I just my religion was bad. I don't think the spirituality failed me or was wrong necessarily. I would love mm-hmm. to come back around to finding that it is true, that it all was true. That'd be so much easier for me because <laughs> I know a lot about it. I've studied it for 30 years. I've lived in it in practice for many for many years. I just am currently not persuaded that it is. But in case it is, I'm a better Christian than I've ever been in my whole life by practice. And most, a lot of Christianity is so focused on behavior and practice that most people would mistake me now for a lot better Christian than they might have mistaken me for before. <laughs> and it's like the kind of thing that you think in your head, like, man, if I didn't have all this structure around me, this, re- this religious spiritual structure, I would be such a mess and there's no telling what kind of trouble I'd be in. Okay, well, I don't anymore. And it's, my life is so much better and easier to manage because I actually have more persuasive reasons to do all this than I had before, apparently. That, that to me... Um... When I, when I listen to that, it, it takes me back to the conversations. I don't know if you remember uh, podcasts early in, in the, the podcast when I was going back and forth with uh, J.D. Hall. Um, and we were, I, was, I was given my own testimony about pornography and all those kinds of things and how uh, because I was a Calvinist when I was dealing with a lot of those, those addictions and those problems, because ultimately, as J.D. Hall uh, alluded in one of the podcasts that he talked about, how when people have these addictions as Christians, um, he called it, well, God sometimes gives people a thorn in the flesh uh, in order to keep them humble. Um, and because that's ultimately where Calvinism leads. If you believe compatibilism, you're ultimately believing that God is one who is ultimately in control of the nature and the circumstances that you're in in such a way that every choice you make is, de- is determined by your desires, your greatest preset desire in a given situation, all of which God determines. And therefore, if I make a decision to look at pornography— and if I did that yesterday at noon, 
I did that because God ordained that I do that, unchangeably ordained it, for his own glory, no less. And therefore, I can't really take ownership as that was my libertarianly free action. I could have done otherwise. I should have done otherwise. God's given me what I need to resist temptation, and I should have resisted temptation. Instead, you have this systematic underpinning all those thoughts to where you can ultimately go, I looked at pornography. Ultimately, if what I believe is true about Calvinism compatibilism, I looked at pornography because God sovereignly ordained that I would look at pornography and could not have done otherwise in order to bring about his greatest glory. And therefore, I have the best excuse that any addict could ever want right there at my fingertips. Now, I would have never verbalized that as a Calvinist. I would have never said that. But deep down underneath it all, there was a part of me that would, would rely upon that as my ultimate go-to excuse. You know, you know, God's keeping me humble. You know, this is a thorn in the flesh he's given me. Uh, and and then, then my only recourse in that situation is not to do the hard work to overcome addiction. The only recourse in that situation is to say, please, God, take away that desire because you're the one who's ultimately controlling my nature and my desires and my circumstances. So, Lord, don't allow me to do that anymore. Stop making me do that. St- you know, change me. Some, what, do what you have to do, you know, like Lazarus or whatever. I'm just this corpse-like person anyway. And so once I'm here, you gotta, you got to change me. you got to make me different. And so if I have this desire, or you come to the conclusion, as I did at times, where, well, maybe I'm just not elect, because obviously elect people, chosen people, don't look at bad stuff on the Internet, and I'm looking at bad stuff on the Internet, so therefore I'm, I'm, maybe God doesn't really love me. Maybe he hasn't really chosen me. And I, went, I remember going through that struggle. And it's just interesting. He, he had a line there, which is what you highlight in your, in your article, too, is that in a sense he had to leave Christianity. I would say, again, he had to leave Calvinistic Christianity in order to take responsibility for his actions and his choices. And I, and I thought that was really telling with the kind of, of Christianity he had adopted where ultimately it's all up to God, in a sense. It, literally, everything's up to God his choices, his desires, his actions, when you ultimately become the victim of God's decree, what he has sovereignly decided for you to do, this is the practical outcome of it. How, how, how have you seen that play out yourself? So, yeah, that's definitely, he's got the, this, this false dilemma. Actually, there's a couple of false dilemmas in there um, in that clip. The first one being about, you know, either God is not real or he's a monster, we'll we'll say. Um, So that's a false dilemma. And then the other one being basically, um, if Christianity is true, free will doesn't exist. Um, Whereas in, you know, if it's, and then the other option being, well, if atheism, if atheism is true, then free will does exist, which that's completely the reverse. Um, Those two are uh, actually to, to believe in free will as an atheist um, is um, inconsistent, especially if you are consistent, taking it to naturalism. Um, I pointed people in my article to Tim Stratton, who has the free thinking argument yep. in ministries.com. And, and uh, I believe that's .com. But anyway, um, and he, he, you know, has a syllogism that walks through the steps and everything basically shows that if you believe in free will, that's an appeal to the soul. And of course the soul is, you know, now you're getting into, you're getting away from, you know, the territory of atheism. So, um, but he kind of shows that through, through the steps of that, that argument. Um, so there's these false, false dilemmas, and I, I think it's just some fatal misunderstandings about what Christianity is. Um, also, just the idea that, that as a Christian, it almost comes across that maybe in his mind he's thinking, I don't do these things um, the reason why God commands me not to do these sins is just because he's randomly decided that these things are sins. Um, so you shouldn't do them. So it's more, 
I don't do it just out of obedience to, to God. And on the other hand, as an atheist, he can say, I don't do these things because they're harmful to me. They're not good for me. I don't want that for myself. And that's, that's just a false, um, a false view because uh, commands for our own good. He, he is interested in our, our own flourishing and desires what is best for us. And I think he's just um, unfortunately misunderstood that. Um, and that I, I guess that just comes from having a, a picture of God um, that is not interested in what is best for us. Yeah, well said. Uh, there's there's one other clip here that gives us hope, you know, with regard to Derek, is that he does seem reasonable still. I mean, he seems open to learning other things, learning more. I, I've put out some feelers, and if anybody has any connections with Derek, I'd love him to come on the podcast and have a discussion because I, I can't help but wonder if he had been taught Christianity rightly. Of course, that's, you know, begging the question to the sense of what we would we, we would explain as Christianity and the way God works. In other words, if he believed, like C.S. Lewis, who he quoted, uh, and and A.W. Tozer and Ravi Zacharias and William Lane Craig and, uh, you know, John Lennox and so many other good apologists and theologians believe versus Ventil, uh, who who he used to listen to and and hold to with more of a Calvinistic presuppositionalist. In fact, uh, you know, just to know that I'm being fair there, um, here here is a clip from him talking about uh, that very point. Listen to this. Yeah, I mean, a yeah. lot of that existed long before Christianity, oh, yeah. and so I don't know. I just like I just choose not to have faith in that because mm. I see no evidence of it needing to be or being actually true. Yeah, it could be, um, but I don't know. But their argument that it is tends to be a presuppositional a su- argument. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I think all so apologetics tricky. are at their core presuppositionalist. Well, I, I just like they'd have to be. Yeah, yeah, and I mean the denomination that, that I'm from, they're they're big. The only apologetics that works is presupposition. Van Til. Yes, of course, Van Til. Oh yeah. But 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 I mean you know it's like so so where. I- so I just wanted to point out. See that that's what he knew. He knew pre- pre- presuppositional apologetics, which is circular. I mean, it's, it's ultimately saying the Bible's true because the Bible says it's true. Uh, God exists because he says he exists. And, and so, uh, you, know, you know, in other words, it's just it's, it's basing itself on itself. It's just a circular presupposition, which is what presupposition is all about. I'm presupposing the existence of God, and I'm, and I'm presupposing that the, the Bible is his word. And I, I don't need to give any kind of evidence or any kind of demonstration of the, the, the reasonableness of our faith. Um, and so it, had he been introduced to the, the more classical or evidential approach to apologetics, I just can't help but wonder uh, if, he w- if his faith would not have been built more on solid ground uh, versus the, the kinds of things that he was obviously uh, you know, on based is things on cir- circular reason, uh, reasoning. Um, but but there is hope, and you mentioned this in your article as well, uh, that he is he seems reasonable and willing to listen. Um, there's a quote here he he gives by Tim Keller, uh, and let, let's play that part of the clip too because I think that's a that's a real telling quote. It shows his openness to still listen and to to hear things, but at the same time, uh, and to to you know to really be able to uh, uh, to know what. Uh, you know what what his heart is, where his heart is now, I guess, so to speak, um, and and willing to hear out what other people think and, and believe. Because I'm smart enough, and I've done this for long enough, and I've thought about it enough to hear every objection in my own head that mm-hmm. anyone listening to this probably has. Because I think it was Tim Keller who once said, "You know, um, you know, tell me the God with whom you are angry and no longer believing in, and I will probably agree with you." Hmm. And something that I have often said that's that I think I probably gleaned from that statement is some gods deserve atheists, hmm. which is to say that maybe, maybe, and I'm willing to allow for my whole deconstruction being my detaching from and crucifying a God who wasn't real and didn't exist and is not the real true God, if there is a real true God. Hmm. And maybe it is a propulsion towards that God or towards that that being, that thing, that force, that energy. Maybe that's ex- precisely where I'm going. Maybe I've had to become an atheist to a false god to find a real one. Hmm. What do you think about that statement, Steve? Um, this, for me, of any clips that I've listened to 
or from the uh, podcasts I've listened to, uh, this clip gives me the most hope for him um, that he kind of sees himself in process in his own faith journey. Um, at this point, he's landed at atheism, um, but he's hopeful that maybe um, this could just be part of the process in leading him to um, the true God, which, you know, at this point, he's open to that being anything. I mean, it could be, you know, he could land it in some other religion, but um, at least, um, you know, I think the thing is right, right now he's, he's so committed to the um, reformed understanding of God and, and what he sees as um, God's character uh, the issues with that when you go back to the theodicy issue and um, those are some big obstacles and talking about presuppositions I think if he's carrying those presuppositions um, that God is um, you know responsible for all the evil in the world um, that God has determined that he shouldn't believe unless unless he's one of his chosen ones if he's carrying these presuppositions and not challenging those, um, you know, that that's, um, you know, a big problem. But, but I, I think one of the things for someone who becomes skeptical, you know, lots of times people become skeptical of Christianity and they, you know, they go through this, this, um, you know, we all, I think most of us, at least who are Christians, if not all, go through a period of doubt and where we start questioning things and that sort of thing. So there can be some healthy skepticism. Um, I just wish for, for Derek that, you know, and I pray for him that he would, would uh, begin to become skeptical of his skepticism and see like, for example, how embracing atheism is now, um, you know, how he sees that as being, consistent with with his practices in terms of being having having personal freedom and if he puts that under a microscope and sees as as an atheist i really cannot have any grounding for free will um, it doesn't make sense so i'm having to live an illusion of free will and i think that's the the conclusion that you must come to if you're if you're landing on that side of skepticism. And I think most of the, the serious atheistic philosophers, you know, the people that are really thinking about this end up landing at that place where, yeah, free will is an illusion. Um, so, you know, that's why I call him back to Christianity. This is the source of free will. If there's gonna be, if, if you want the freedom that you, are currently experiencing it only makes sense um, in the, the Christian context, and I think you know being an atheist, you can you don't have to um, believe in God to um, obviously you know have morals or to to live you know in a way where you have free will. So you don't have to acknowledge those things properly because they are. They are gifts that God has given us, um, but they only make sense if he if he wants to make sense of them um, in his beliefs. They only make sense when you have have a source for for freedom in that, yeah. and that is something that naturalism cannot explain. Yeah, I totally agree with you, and I think that's a, a great apologetic. And one of the reasons I do this this program. You know, people ask why, why you know, put so much effort in this. The, this is why, um, and 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 I know these are just two people who happen to be, you know, Megan Phelps and uh, Derek Webb, just happen to be two people who um, or public figures, and who had some, you know, publicity around their leaving of Christianity and and from Calvinistic worldview, um, and therefore, you know, focusing on them it may not seem fair because you're just, hey, you're just, you know, uh, you're you're special pleading you know you're you're picking one particular person out of a crowd of, of millions and you're right you, there are a lot of for every one Derek Webb there are th thousands of good Calvinistic Christians who continue in the faith and continue to follow God 
um, and and it, and it would be wrong of us to try to, to make it seem otherwise. Um, however, yeah. when, when you're not in... When I, you're, I would yeah. definitely want to just to say when I wrote my article, the intention is definitely not to say if you're, if you're a Calvinist, um, you're going to end up like Derek Webb. Um, exactly. You know, m- most Calvinists are not going to go down that road. They will, they will stay faithful to Christ. I think that's been, you know, evidence um, throughout, you know, throughout the history of Calvinism. Uh, sure. We've had many great Christians who were, were Calvinists and did great things. Um, so I don't want to say that. I just, the, the point of the article in a sense was to, to show that, um, you know, this, this when taken to its logical outcome, you know, when a Calvinist follows it consistently, it can lead, it can lead them away. Um, you know, right. that I, was one of the and, purposes. And, and from yeah, my experience, yeah, again, my experience is unique because not everybody does a podcast uh, confronting the issues of Calvinism, have been a former Calvinist like I was and all those kinds of things. And so I mean, a very unique situation, but I literally get messages weekly from people who are struggling with the same things that Derek Webb are, is talking about, um, who either became Calvinistic or close to becoming Calvinistic, close to leaving the faith, those kinds of things. And so to me, it seems like a bigger problem than probably most Calvinists would think it is. And, and I have to keep that in perspective because of my unique spot in this, in, in this world uh, in, in, as an apologist confronting this issue on a podcast that for whatever reasons have become you know, somewhat popular. Um, I get a lot of messages of people who are, who are asking these questions and coming to these conclusions and dealing with this struggle. And so to me, it seems like this is a lot bigger issue than probably a lot of other maybe Christian leaders or uh, people in this discussion may not even recognize. But I have to keep that balance with the fact that I'm kind of a magnet for those kinds of comments and, and commentary. And so the, the, it may not be near as bad as that, but but even if one person, this is the thing, if Calvinism is wrong, again, just 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 pretend that Calvinism is wrong, okay? We, we all need to be able to do that, step out of our worldview and say, what if I'm wrong about this soteriology? And I, we need to do that as traditionalists as well. Um, and I've done that as a, as a traditionalist. I've said, what if I'm wrong and Calvinists are right? And, and I've had to answer that question. And the, the answer to that question is, well, if I'm wrong, it's because compatibilistically God decreed for me to be wrong. And I, and I, I want him not to decree that. I, I would rather him for, for him to decree for me to be right. And I would rather for him to change me. And so I've, I've literally prayed, not jokingly, not, not facetiously, not sarcastically, literally prayed just like, Jay, j- just like uh, Derek was here. God, if you want me to be a Calvinist, please make me see the light of Calvinism again. Help me to, to, to be right. I, I want to be decreed to be on the right side of this. So if you can change me through irresistible means, please do. Uh, through effectual uh, compatibilistic means, please make me Calvinistic. And because I, obviously, if I'm wrong, I've been determined, decreed, compatibilistically, causally determined, whatever you want to say. I have been decreed to be what I am and to do this podcast. And 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 I don't want to be used as a vessel to lead people astray by God's sovereign decree. And I would rather Him decree me to be a, a Narcissus Brule type of teacher if that's what is is correct and right. So that's that, that's my side of it. If Calvinism is right, no less people are going to heaven uh, or hell because of what I'm doing on this podcast. I'm not gonna I'm not thwarting anything that God wants me to be doing. I'm doing exactly what God wants me to be doing. So I, I feel pretty safe. <laughs> and if Calvinism is right and I'm wrong, I feel pretty safe in that because I'm really genuine. I know my heart. I genuinely want to teach what's right. And I've asked genuinely, God, help me to do what's right. And that's all I can do if, if I'm wrong. But if I'm right, and Calvinists are wrong, and Calvinists need to be objective enough to step into that world and say, okay, if I'm wrong, and if Calvinism is wrong, then how many hundreds of thousands of people over the years have possibly come to the same kinds of conclusions that Derek Webb has come to about the monstrous view, or that Megan Phelps have come to about the monstrous evil view of God that they see it as, and have walked away from the Christian faith because they equate Christianity with what you're calling uh, Calvinism. And they see that, and they read Romans 9, and they read these other passages, not the way that we have explained them and the way that the first uh, 400 years of the church explained them, um, but instead the way uh, 
Augustine on, and, and many uh, theologians from the Reformed tradition have explained it, and they have come to the conclusion that is a pill I cannot swallow, that God is ultimately causally determining all things that come to pass, even the heinous uh, tortures and murders and rapes of, of humanity um, for his own self-glorification, and they just can't swallow that pill. And so they say, if that's true, I'm walking away from Christianity altogether. And it seems like it is true because that's the only way I can understand that passage because that's the only way it's really been explained to me with any depth. And that is that is why I'm doing this broadcast. If, if for no other reason than to just help people to see there is better, more robust theological explanations than what Calvinists have proposed and the false dichotomy of either God's looking through the quarters of time and some uh, you know, for, for side of faith view, quarters of time view, um, that that's the only other alternative to Calvinism out there and saying, no, there are many, many more robust theologians out there that maybe you're not privy to, especially at this unique time in history with the internet being dominated by Calvinistic theologians. Um, there is better, uh, apologetics than what the Calvinistic apologetic of theodicy offers. There's better, uh, answers to those hard questions than what is being popularized today on most of the big internet sites. And that needs to get out there. And that's why we need help getting this word out. That's why we need more people doing, uh, uh, you know, what we're doing here and trying to get the broadcast out there and, and supporting people, uh, you know, other scholars out there who are teaching these truths uh, and make them known so that we can answer the rise, resurging of this, this, this doctrine so as to answer it with sound, robust, loving and, and kind teaching, but at the same time, firm and saying, this is what the Bible teaches about God's love and provision for all people. Um, and so uh, any, any last words on this? I know that your article, uh, I, I will post your article. Matter of fact, with your permission, I'll just reblog it uh, with this video uh, on, on the blog site. And of course, with the link back to your original blog, and we'll just um, get this out, this word out there through th this avenue and try to do our best to spread the, the word of those who may be right where Derek Webb uh, has gone and, and, and Megan, Megan Phelps has gone and saying maybe they're, they're thinking about leaving Christianity and they need to find a video like this to say, hey, there are better answers to these issues than what the Calvinists have offered. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. Uh, no problem. I, I, I don't mind you linking that. Um, you know, I just think that any good theology must begin with a good God. And I think that's where Derek has it wrong at this point. His theology begins with a God who is evil. And, um, you know, one of the other ideas I wanted to get across in the article and that we have, didn't really talk about yet, but just kind of the idea of assurance in in salvation and how um, Calvinism kind of offers this promise of assurance. And I think that a lot of people, when we talk about, you know, the, the uh, letters you're getting and, and things like that, there are a lot of Calvinists out there who are going through these doubts and saying, well, am I really one of the elect? Why am I struggling with this sin? Uh, why do I have these doubts? And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's something that's kind of hard to make sense of from taking the Calvinist perspective. And, um, it makes, so I think it makes plenty of sense in ours. Um, you know, we can, we are still free to, you know, to doubt. And we're, you know, we have these struggles. Um, and it's just part of, part of being human and not having that, the, the view of the world that God has. We, we go through times that are, are difficult and challenge our faith um, and that sort of thing. Um, so it's, uh, for me, it's just, you know, I see, all these things and a lot of things that that Derek is holding on to in his views of, of the Christian God. And my hope is that he would uh, bring skepticism to those things. And then that, that might, if he if he puts those under a microscope and and considers that maybe he he's wrong in, in these presuppositions. And um, 
Well, and you're speaking, uh, speaking of those presuppositions earlier in one of the clips, we didn't play it on, on this broadcast, but if you go back and listen to those, which I encourage you to get, go listen to those full interviews, um, and I'll put links uh, to those in the show notes as well so you can go back and hear those for yourself. But he talks about Rob Bell and, you know, Catholics that are real, quote unquote, liberal, um, talking about, you know, there's many paths to God. And he said, you know, and he, he even goes on to say, you know, there's a lot of people who are trying to make Christianity more palatable and more reasonable in sounding and, and more acceptable sounding. And, and then he makes the, the correct point of saying, but that's not biblical Christianity. Um, and I, he said, I appreciate the fact that they're trying to make Christianity more tolerable and more, uh, you know, widespread and acceptable. But he said, that's just not what the Bible teaches. And what I get the impression of is that he was kind of lumping, uh, you know, people like myself um, who still hold to, I think, a very high view of Scripture and a very, uh, quote unquote, conservative uh, view of inerrancy of, of God's word and all those kinds of things in with the Rob Bells of the world. In other words, and I think Calvinists sometimes see us that way. We're, we're just trying to make the Bible more palatable by making a God a provision, a provisional God of of love for all people, and we're just trying to we're just trying to take you know justify God and, and take away the the edge of of Scripture by making him you know less Calvinistic sounding, and the, we want to make the pill easier to swallow and all that kind of stuff. And that's not the truth of it. That that for me, it's not the truth of it. Now, maybe there are some people who reject Calvinism because of of the hard pill that it is to swallow, or maybe some of them that feel like they need to deny inerrancy in order to uh, to deny Calvinism. Um, in, in, or, in other words, well, the Bible obviously does teach Calvinism, so let's just not believe that the Bible is perfectly truthful and that we need to adapt it somehow. Now, no, I truly believe that Romans nine doesn't teach what Calvinists think it teaches. I truly believe that Ephesians 1 doesn't say what Calvinists have interpreted it to say. And I think we have very reasonable, robust theological explanations, exegetical explanations for how those passages were taken in the first 400 years of the Christian church and should still be taken today. If you understand first century Judaism, if you understand, uh, you know, the the, the issues of, of the corporate perspective um, of the more collectivist mentality of that century, there's not any reason to walk away with a Calvinistic interpretation of those texts. And what convinced me to leave Calvinism is not the emotional appeals and the hard pill to swallow. I was willing to swallow the pill. I gladly swallowed the pill and drank the Kool-Aid for two, for a decade. Um, that's not the issue. It's what does the Bible intend to say? What is, is the author intending to say in this particular text? And I am thoroughly convinced, more convinced than I've been convinced of anything in my life, that Paul and the other authors of Scripture were not intending to teach Calvinistic soteriology. That's why I teach this. That's why I'm doing these things. And so I just want to be abundantly clear that our motivation here is not to say, hey, run from Calvinism because it makes people atheistic. Um, I'm, I'm saying don't become a Calvinist because Calvinism is not what the Bible teaches, per, for, first and foremost. Because there may be something about what the Bible does actually teach that that may people may become cal, may be atheistic over. For some for some people, they'll read something that's very true uh, about the Scripture, about who God is, about what happened, and, and you know they may see the story of Noah or something like that and say, "Well, I'm just not going to be believing a God that would that would allow the flood. Um, I'm just not going to believe in that God." So I'm going to become an atheist based upon a true story, um, and you can't stop people from making those kinds of choices. You can reason with them. You can help them explain apologetically through apologetics and, and explain why God might have done what he did and those kinds of things to help people to understand God's choices. But you can't stop people from choosing to walk away from the faith uh, because of, of truth. And so I, I just want to be really clear on that point. If, if Calvinism is true and people are becoming atheistic because they just can't swallow the pill of Calvinism, then, you know, obviously— that's because God decreed for them not to be chosen or for them to be able to swallow that pill. And, and we've just got, you know, you got to accept it for what it is, but I, that's why I've rejected it because it is, I don't believe it's taught scripturally. And I, I think that has to be pointed out as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the whole, um, related to the, you know, the field of apolo uh, apologetics and just how we present Christianity to, to others um, we want to make sure that people are rejecting Christianity and not some 
uh, false version of Christianity. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's it's just absolutely essential that we get these things right. Yep. Well, and, that, and that's what's interesting. He you mentioned Tim Keller there in that last quote. Um, and I've done other broadcasts with Tim Keller. It's it's interesting when he's on the Verifos forum and other places, and he's talking about the doctrine of hell, or if he's asking being asking questions about free will and all these other things. Um, it's one of the reasons Tim Keller's not real popular among the the you know re- reformed groups uh, is that he gives very inconsistent answers. If you haven't noticed, he he talks he quotes C. S. Lewis and he quotes from uh, our scholars and he talks like us uh, when he's answering those questions. But then when he's talking about sociology, he kind of reverts back to Calvinism. And and I've played them side by side in several broadcasts. If you haven't heard those, go back and listen to them, and you'll hear what I'm talking about. Where in, in one question about hell in a Verifrost forum with a bunch of atheists, he sounds like William Lane Craig or, uh, or C.S. Lewis. And then whenever he's in his theological bubbles talking about Calvinism, he sounds like John Piper. And you're going, okay, whoa, you know, that, that, that's just an inconsistent uh, Calvinism. It's not, you're not being consistent with yourself. And that may work when people aren't following you. But if, if people are following and really listening apologetically in a sense that they're really paying attention, they're educated on who you are and what you teach, that's not going to hold water. It, it just doesn't, it just, it doesn't work. And, and I think usually atheists are typically people who are lean intellectual and they, they study and they're trying to unpack all these things. And they're going to notice those blatant contradictions and inconsistencies real clearly. And that's why I think as an apologist, I'm striving to be uh, truthful with what God's word teaches and consistent with how we uh, paint what true Christianity is so that people aren't walking away from uh from Christianity, as you said, from a more of a straw man view of it and, and really understand Christianity for what it, it truly is and how it's truly being taught. And what and Jesus is the best model for that. I, I think if we understand Christianity through the eyes of Jesus, the, the word in flesh, who, who often said in, in his own sermon, you've heard it said, but I say to you, what, what's he doing? He, if, if not correcting the misconceptions about who people thought God was. You've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, justice, justice, justice. I say, mercy. I say, you know, if they take your coat, give them your shirt as well. Um, I'm showing you grace. You've heard it said, you know, uh, just love your friends, but hate your enemies. No, here's what I'm telling you. Love your enemies because that's what God does. That's who God is. In other words, what's Jesus doing if not redefining and uh, refocusing the truth of who he is. And therefore you have to read everything we read from the old Testament and all the troubling passages through the eyes of Jesus and through his words. That's my apologetic is Jesus Christ. It's through his revelation, ultimate, complete, final revelation that I filter everything else I read. That's troubling through the words of Jesus Christ. And, and, and James, the brother of Jesus, I mean, he gives the same kind of a thing. Hey, a lot of people around here going, Jesus, God tempts people to evil. Okay, guys, don't, don't, don't believe that nonsense about when people say God's tempting me, blaming everything on God, like, like the therapists talk about, just you know, putting it back onto God. God didn't tempt anybody to evil. He can't be tempted to evil. He doesn't tempt anybody to evil. Stop blaming that on God. Um, and and it's, it's as if James is saying the same thing in, in chapter 1. Don't blame stuff on God. It's not God's fault. It's not God's doing. He very clearly in Jeremiah seven thirty one. That didn't even enter my mind when they're talking about the sins they were committing. It's not something I commanded you. It's not something I want you to do. Um, these are the kinds of things I think are misconceptions that sometimes you see throughout, especially Old Testament texts, where oftentimes um, people, when talking, are giving blame or credit to God for things that He's not taking blame or credit for. Uh, but they just automatically naturally do that because they're they're ultimately making God's permission of something as if it's something that He willed or wanted, um, and and the Scripture seems to correct that that misapplication. Uh, for example, even Job, uh, uh, blessed is the name of the Lord, is often what we hear. We say He's given and He's taken away. Um, so blessed, but blessed be His name. Well, technically, because of what we know that actually happened, Satan's the one who took away not God. So technically, Job didn't get it right. <laughs> He's, the Lord is given. That's true. The Lord is taken away. Not technically accurate. What's technically accurate is that Satan took it away. God allowed him. Uh, God permitted him to do that, obviously. But that's not the same as him doing it. 
And so permitting or allowing for evil and suffering to take place is not the same as saying God did that. And so we've got to be really careful to misapply and misinterpret things uh, with regard to God's permission or his allowing of things, which if we read through Calvin, obviously, he says it's a vain refuge to speak of God's permission or his allowing of certain things, or he's a, it's an invention, uh, Calvin even says. And so I, I just think that's where Calvinism has gone too far, and they've taken things into a ditch of, of what is more of a fatalistic way of thinking. And I think fatalism, when it's, 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 it plays itself out in places like with Derek and his, the way he's taken this, is it becomes a ultimately a crutch and a reason for abandoning uh, the faith and, and refusing to take responsibility for your own beliefs, uh, refusing to take responsibility for your own sinful actions and choices uh, to the point where you walk away from the faith because it's a faith you never owned as your own, which is what your article beautifully points out. And so, Steve, thank you for writing uh, the article. Thank you for bringing this to my attention, and thank you for joining me on today's podcast. Any any last parting words as we uh, close this thing off? Yeah, yeah. I, my challenge to Derek is just, yeah, again, be skeptical of your skepticism. Yes. And also just the idea for for Christians to have faith. It's 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 our responsibility to believe we may go through doubts periods of doubts i had that in my own life i came through that um that period and um now i'm much stronger for it um for him he's gone kind of in the other direction at this point um so i i i hope that he would challenge challenge those things those presuppositions that he brings to it and um just ask that we pray for him. He obviously has a lot of knowledge of, of the Bible. Hmm. I think he's a very authentic person. Yes. And as a Calvinist, he's, you know, even though he's an unbelieving Calvinist at this point, um, he's a very, very consistent. And he sees the consistency and the implications of, of his beliefs and is applying them consistently. Um but yeah, I, I I would hope that you know he would challenge those those beliefs and and uh, see Christianity, the true Christianity, um, become an atheist to the God that is false and and believe in the God that is real. Hmm. So that's my prayer and my hope for him. Well, not only for Derek, but for any of those who may be turn, tuning in, uh, who who are struggling with the same things, uh, because I imagine this art this this particular broadcast and article will uh, attract those who may be struggling with the same doubts and issues uh, as Derek and, and Megan Phelps have gone through. And so my, my prayer is just as yours uh, for Derek, for all that may be listening, to really be willing to challenge those presuppositions. Don't just assume uh, that the, the, what you've been taught about certain passages are, are true until you've checked out the best of the scholars from both perspectives and really understand them well. And so uh, I appreciate you challenging us to that end, Steve. Thank you for the broadcast and uh, and for, for being here and for the article as well. And so uh, God bless you and your work and continue to do what you're doing. Keep writing. Uh, you're, you're good at it. And, uh, and appreciate those who've tuned in. We'll see you next time. God bless. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks for attending our online university classroom. Remember, this is a listener-supported ministry, so please consider becoming a patron of the podcast by donating online. Join our team and help spread the word. For more resources, books, and articles from Professor Flowers, or to learn how you can support this ministry, please visit www.soteriology101.com.